Okay, so dear webinar participants, dear moderators, honorable guests, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, but not good night, uh, hopefully. And welcome to Mid Sweden University's webinar entitled On the Shoulders of Interaction. My name is Alia Amir. Today we'll be hosting two stars, two giants of social interaction research, Elizabeth Stoko and Nigel Musk. And as some of you might know that Mid Sweden University's data sessions uh, were founded in the year 2021 to um, collaborate and do data sessions uh, to host data session seminars um, and we started this collaboration with uh, together with other colleagues uh, Rizwan Haq, as you know who is the co-organizer and coordinator of this uh, webinar as well besides Rizwan we have two more colleagues in our team uh, Sabria Dr. Sabria Jauher and Dr. Chihat Attar some of you um, who work with AMCA and other linguistics areas of studies um, would know their names and their work as well. For our two sessions, uh, we are generously being supported by our colleagues at the Department of Social Sciences and Humanities, HSV, uh, and the subject English, uh, Dr. Rachel Allen and Professor Terry Walker. And before I move on to introduce our first moderator and first guest, let me briefly remind you about the house rules of this webinar. Please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, we'll be recording this, the, these talks and the recording has already started and we will be uploading them on YouTube. For each session, uh, whenever the session ends, you'll have plenty of time for the question answer sessions and as about 100 participants register for it, we've kept the question answer session quite long. For the first session, let me introduce our first moderator first, who is Rachel Allen, and she's a corpus linguist and senior lecturer in English linguistics at Mid Sweden University. Her current research focus is on how we can use corpora and digital tools effectively in teaching and learning English. And now moving on to the introduction of our first guest, Elizabeth Stuckel. She's a professor of social interaction at Logo University, where she studies conversation analysis. And she has developed a conversation analytic role play method, CALM, an approach to communication skills training based on evidence about what sorts of problems and roadblocks can occur in conversation, as well as the techniques and strategies that best resolve these problems. And without taking more of your time, uh, I hand over the floor to Rachel. Hi. So we're delighted to, um, to welcome Elizabeth Stocco to um, this symposium. Um, and Alia has already given some information. I'm going to give a little bit more. Um, so Elizabeth conducts conversa conversation analytic research to understand how talk works from first dates to medical communication and from sales encounters to hostage negotiation. She's worked as an industry fellow at Typeform and is currently on secondment at Deployed. And in addition to academic publishing, she's passionate about science communication, has given talks at TED, New Scientist, Google, Microsoft and the Royal Institution. So a wide range of uh, places there. And her book, The Talk, The Science of Conversation was published by Little Brown in 2018. And she's co-authored a book on crisis talk coming out later this year. She's a Wired Innovation Fellow and in 2021 was awarded Honorary Fellowship of the British Psychological Society. So we're Delighted to have you here, and um, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about conversation analysis in the wild. So, um, without further ado, if you would like to start. Thank you very much, Rachel and Alia and, and colleagues for um, inviting me to, to come and talk to you today. Um, I just need permission to share my screen so I can uh, put my slides up. Thank you. Okay, 
hopefully you can see a Welsh Valley <laughs> um, and hopefully you can now see my title slide. Great. So yes, uh, thanks again so much for, for inviting me to, to this webinar today. Um, well, I'm going to do a range of things um, under the heading of conversation analysis in the wild. So obviously anybody who is familiar with conversation analysis and the research method and the research approach will know that one of the things that is a sort of principle behind the way we work is to study real encounters in the wild. Uh, research um, that studies real encounters between anybody who is communicating um, as it happens. So not simulated interaction, not role-played interaction, not interactions that happen in the laboratory. And we don't typically interview people after they've had an interaction or, or survey them uh, about the conversations that they have. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of taken. What I'm going to talk about today more is what happens when conversation analysts take their research outside ac academia, um, the world beyond the academy and beyond conversation analysis. And I'm going to walk us through examples of just one theme in my research that found its way into um, the, the kind of calm training and so on um, that I've done with different practitioners. Um, but in projects that all started outside of academia or came via um, the, the problem that was sort of articulated to me by a practitioner in, in different settings, which I'll, I'll explain as I go. Um, and so I'm not going to do lots of detailed conversation analysis, um, but instead talk a little bit about the extracts that I'm going to present and how practitioners respond to them and those kinds of things. And then hopefully at the end of the talk, um, I'm going to go back to the beginning when I started um, my work in academia as a PhD student, um, in which I studied university classroom education, because obviously this is a webinar that is at least partly framed around classroom interaction and, and teaching practice. Um, and for the last four or five years, I've been working as part of a research team led by Karianne Skovolt at University of Southeast Norway, looking at conversation analysis in teacher education. Um, and it's kind of nice to, to come and talk to audiences where there is that interest because it is where my own uh, career started. And then what I'm also hoping is that after I've um, been speaking for 40 minutes or so, that um, you'll ask me lots of questions and feel free to ask me anything at all. Um, I'm very open about um, most, most, most of my academic life, so, so feel free to ask any questions that, that grab you as I'm, as I'm moving through the presentation. Okay, so um, one of the things that is um, a, a kind of constant starting point for me these days um, around talking about conversation analytic research to audiences that aren't familiar with what, what conversation analysts do, but of course are really interested in communication because that's probably why they've asked me to come and talk to them or something like that, is how challenging it can be to talk about conversation analytic research to audiences that already know a lot about communication, partly because they've been communicating their whole lives and so they have much anecdata uh, about how talk works. And so that can sometimes be quite difficult because people already think they know a lot about talk and indeed they do because you know conversation analysts study people uh, finding their way through their lives via, via social interaction. Um, but one of the challenges can be that because there is so much um, people's own experience about interactions and there is also a lot of, of sort of popular science stuff out there about communication, it means that there's also quite a lot of communication myth and some of the things that we think we know about talk are incredibly compelling um, but with very little evidence or no evidence at all um, but because they've got such a life of their own they're quite hard to make fall over but at least it's one of the one of the things that drives me to do um, so much sort of public engagement these days is to try and make myths fall over and sometimes it's because the myth is not just a communication myth that doesn't really have much evidence behind it but because the the assumptions that we have about social interaction can then drive and underpin um, the way we assess people's communication skills, for example, the criteria that we put around um, what we might think people should be talking like, um, or it can drive policy um, and strategy in ways that can end up being quite problematic. 
So maybe we can come back to that um, at the end. But of course, one of the most well known of these myths is, is this, this idea that um, communication is 93% nonverbal. Um, if you Google that, you'll just find endless images, endless slides and endless PowerPoint pie charts and graphs and so on that look a bit like this, uh, which tell you about this, this particular um, apparent, apparent fact about communication. And, and of course, you know, this is very easy one to make fall over, um, as Max Atkinson has done um, in conversation with Albert Morabian, who, you know, wrote the studies from which people make these generalizations and these assertions in which they discussed um, not only the problem um, with the misinterpretation of the findings. And this is a quote from from the original author who, uh, himself in 2002, but even things like um, why is radio so popular then? <laughs> why do people listen to podcasts? Um, how come I don't really speak French very well, you know, but, so, so I definitely couldn't just get by on nonverbal communication for 93% of the time. Um, how can we talk in the dark, you know, the, all these kinds of things. Um, so I think it's important to, to for, for me, this is a big driver, why I want to show people how talk actually works and what it looks like in the wild, um, to, to try and cut through um, some of these sorts of myths. Um, so this is a, my, my, my sort of starting point for the more empirical part of the talk today, um, which is to do with something that I have noticed ha happening in, in lots of different interaction settings. Um, and this is something that I wrote about with Ryan Sickfeland and John Simmons. And, and the notion is something like burden, the, the burden on people. Um, to get their interactions kind of completed to sort of move through an interaction from A to B with the least friction and how much effort and, and how much onus there is on the, let's say, a service user, um, a patient, a customer um, to, to get some service achieved, even though the, the service that they're talking to, um, the organisation that they're talking to is, is sort of somewhat obliged to provide that service. Um, so, so, and because I work across lots of different environments, um, this notion of burden is the one that I want to show you some examples of. Um, where I, and this feeds into, it turns out, I didn't really know this when I was doing the research, but, but there's, a, there's a huge domain out there about customer experience, hashtag CX. Um, PX, there's a whole domain of, of kind of uh, professional bodies and training and so on around patient experience. Um, and then, of course, UX um, into the more sort of end technology and, and digital startups and, and, and apps and chatbots and all of those kinds of things. And so all of all of these areas have something that we can show is is useful to know from conversation analytic research. So um, that's what I want to talk about mostly today, um, at least in the sort of more um, data driven part of the talk. But um, this is this is a kind of webinar and um, let's start in a cafe. I'm hoping some of you might have a drink um, as you uh, are in this webinar. So this is um, I'm going to show you three different brief encounters in a cafe. And in each encounter, the customer wants to use the Wi-Fi, um, but doesn't know whether it's actually available for customers to use. But the cafe in, in these examples does have Wi-Fi. Um, and by the end of each encounter, the customer is going to be able to use the Wi-Fi. And so what we're going to see is the same outcome. Customer gets to use the cafe's Wi-Fi, but with quite different ways of getting there. The impact, the overall CX, the overall experience at the cafe. So let's have a look at the first one. Um, the cafe customer, having got their drink, says, do you have Wi-Fi? Cafe staff, yes, we do. Um, can customers use it? Yes, they can. Um, do I need a code or? <coughs> um, thanks. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see straight away that this isn't really a very satisfactory experience. And at least the next example would be much better. So uh, imagine it went more like this. Do you have Wi-Fi? Hands over the code. Thanks. So obviously that, that first opening question uh, is not a closed yes, no question that somehow only ever gets a yes or no in response. It's also a vehicle for another action, which is a request to use the Wi-Fi. And in this case, you know, it's kind of neutral. Like I asked for the thing, you gave me the thing, and that was good. 
but but here's here's the amazing one so this these are all field notes um it, it's it's easy as a conversation analyst to get sort of trapped in in conversations that you're in but so i quite often make field notes um so this is um being given the the, the, the drink by the cafe staff member and as the drink comes uh, across the counter the cafe staff member says oh by the way if you need the wi-fi here's the code <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is this is amazing service because I didn't even have to ask. Um, I didn't have to make the request. And the worst thing that could happen is I didn't need the Wi-Fi. I suppose there's always a situation where someone might say, do I look like the kind of person who needs Wi-Fi in cafes? And you could take offence, but it's, it's unlikely. Um, and what we have here is just something immediately quite interesting, which is how much burden is the sort of interactional burden and that sense that you are a bit of a burden on somebody when you really have to push for something especially when you are going to get it at the end and the company is is somewhat obliged to, to give you that service as well so um this this is the theme that i want to stay with uh for for a little bit more in some more examples and of course one of the things you can sort of start to hopefully see here is that if i was talking to an organization i might say it's quite good to be proactive and offer people you know, make offers rather than wait for requests. But if people do make requests, don't make them beg for the thing that you are kind of there um, to provide in the first place. So um, I'm going to start um, with a, a, a sense of pre-burden. And by pre-burden, what I want to show you is just some examples of things that I've been looking at recently, um, partly um, with, with other colleagues, um, Sophie Parslow at Loughborough and, and Saul Albert and Ryan Sickfield. And we've been thinking about um, what happens before somebody speaks to a human call, you know, a person in an organisation, before you even get to the human, what happens? And so we're going to move from the cafe to the GP uh, surgery reception. And we're going to look at bits of communication that organisations have, you know, quite a lot of control over, which is the things that they do automatically with their their, in this case, their patients before a, an actual conversation takes place. So calls to, of course, many organisations these days are an answered, first of all, by an auto attendance system. And there's two parts to these systems. First of all, you might hear a recorded message and then you might be left on hold. And one of the really nice things about some of the data that I've um, been given over the years by by organizations that want me to you know go and look at it and find things that might help <clears throat> is that some of the recordings have absolutely everything that that people do right from the start um, so he, in the in the GP patient um, uh, data that I'm looking at I'm looking at uh, patients calling their doctors and it's the reception encounter that I'm looking at not the medical part of the encounter and so we get to hear the recorded message and what people do when they are waiting and listening to the recorded message and then when they're waiting on hold, <clears throat> including any verbalised responses uh, to that. For example, hopefully you'll be able to hear this, you just have to wait for it. Oh, what a bloody fuss. So I'm hoping that you can hear, <laughs> and, uh, even if you don't know the, the sort of colloquial <laughs> swearing, uh, but this is just somebody waiting and kind of swearing as they're, as they're waiting on hold to be connected to a, to a human uh, receptionist at the other end. And of course, what you can start to think is, are the things that we can learn about auto attendance systems, for example, and being on hold, that we can take out of the um, so that we can kind of not, not, not designedly irritate people before the human receptionist has to pick up and now hear um, the person who's been irritated by whatever it is that you've put uh, into your auto attendance system. So I'm going to play you a couple of other clips now um, and you're going to see um, the transcript which is anonymized come out in time with the transcript and so this is now the start of a call right just the first um, opening two lines between a receptionist at the doctors and a patient so here it comes. Hello, inquiries speaking. Oh, yeah, I wonder if it was uh, if it'd be possible to speak to that for you. Okay, so nothing special here. Hello, inquiries, Sal speaking. Hi, I wonder if it's possible to speak to Dr. Crouch, please. So, um, the reason I'm showing you this one is because you may or may not be 
surprised by what happened while this person, this patient who is now sort of being perfectly polite to the receptionist, what they were doing a couple of minutes earlier on hold. Um, and I want to show you this partly because I think that some of the other myths that, that float around is that patients are really aggressive to receptionists on, in, in these calls and that, that, that surgeries have to manage people's bad behaviour and so on. Um, it's probably not a very popular thing to say, but, but we don't really find much evidence of that in the hundreds of calls that we look at, whereby patients typically aren't, aren't rude from the get go. Um, but I just want to see an example of, of, the, of what people are just doing all the time, which is switching from expressing their utter frustration when there isn't actually a human being to hear it and then swerving and being really polite when they actually do speak to the receptionist. So here's what happens on hold. <laughs> Medical Centre is now the flu vaccination appointment. Oh, if you are eligible for a flu vaccination and haven't had one yet, please ask reception to book you an appointment. So basically what we've been discovering is that patients often sigh and swear and emote when they're on hold, um, but also it's not random. So we, we've started to look at what is it that generates a oh or a, oh or a swearing. Um, and it's things like, thank you for holding, your call is important to us. <laughs> and you immediately sort of hear. So you can start to see, well, maybe trying to take some of these things out of those um, um, recordings would be useful because most people really just want to know that they're still connected and they're still waiting and the call hasn't dropped, but, but probably the messages that we put in there might not be always the most useful. Um, here's another example. This is now the auto message um, after being on hold at a GP surgery. So this is just an example of a typical message, at least in UK surgeries, of what you might hear when you get through. Welcome to Medical Centre. This is Dr. Uh, calls may be recorded for quality and training purposes. Please be aware, we have a zero tolerance policy. We expect all of our staff to be addressed in a polite and respectful manner. We will be unable to help you if you are rude or aggressive towards us. Please select one of the following options. So I think it's quite interesting to live through those and occasionally when I get to play them to, to you know people who run practices or run clinical commissioning groups they're quite horrified by some of the messages that doctors just routinely have as part of their this is the way we welcome you to the surgery and at least in the research that I've done I don't really find any evidence that we that that, that patients just phone up and are immediately um, rude or aggressive that in fact that you know there are there, there are ways of making this journey um, as smooth as possible right from the start Please note, appointments are for 10 minutes and for one problem only. Now, all, all sorts of things that, that are probably very familiar um, to, to people, especially in the UK, but, but things that just don't really seem to have any evidence behind why they are there present in these recorded messages. And this is um, a, an image um, figure um, produced by Sophie Parslow. Um, where we have looked at what are the contents of these auto recorded messages. So they all contain an identification of the surgery, a greeting, um, a closing, um, mostly, um, a behavioural steer. So if you need this, do that. Um, a call recording notification, um, some period of silence and a menu. But what you can see from just comparing three surgeries is that um, they are quite different in terms of where they happen, how long they are, um, you can see in GP1 that they do a greeting right in the middle of the call. Uh, and that's because what they've had is an old message that they've now needed to add new things to. And so rather than smooth out the entire message, they've just sort of added on a, an extra bit at the start and then halfway through you get welcome to the surgery. So, you know, you, you're sort of into this and you're like, am I even in the right place? So all of this tells you that you can change things. You know, we tend to think, oh, these things are rigid and we must say this and we must say that and we must say that. Um, but actually, um, when you start to dig into the reality of, of these surgeries, you can see that there are differences. And then you can also start to associate the differences that happen even before two people have spoken to each other and the scores that um, surgeries get on in, in, the, in England, at least there's a GP patient survey and you can go and have a look at the scores on something like 40 items um, or, or more um, to see how the surgeries are doing. So just to continue on that theme for a minute, um, I want to think about pushing for service a bit more in, in the GP um, 
surgeries again. And everything that I'm going to show you, I've seen in other sectors and other services. Um, I've studied everything from people phoning the council, environmental health, law firms, making booking holidays, um, buying windows. And the core communication issue here of sort of pushing for something um, it is kind of common to all of these settings. So here's an example of um, a telephone call now back, back at the GP surgery. Um, and um, you can see what's going on as the, the patient asks whether they've got a, an appointment for Friday afternoon or tea time, please. Good morning, surgery. Evening. Hello, have you got an appointment for Friday afternoon or tea time, please? This Friday. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, we're fully booked on Friday. So at this point, um, the question is, what should happen next? So if I was doing this in, in a calm workshop, I'd get people to think about what 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 would you do next? And, and most people say, well, we'd offer an alternative. We'd say, sorry, we're fully booked on Friday. Do you want me to check you know, for other times and, and make an offer? Um, but it was quite common that we found that um, what happens next was what happened next. And, and so you would have this situation where the patient would find themselves on the way out of an interaction without having their request met or even any alternatives offered. Um, and this is how it goes. Right. OK, OK, yeah, OK. Uh and there's just one particular detail that I want you to notice around line 17 and 18 there at the end of the transcript whereby the patient, you can hear them kind of not quite thinking, wow, is this really the end of the conversation? OK. Uh, um, and at line 18 in overlap, and the overlap's quite important, um, and, and the position in the overall sequence of that thank you, the receptionist says thank you. So from the receptionist point of view, they've, they've done what this, they've, they've delivered service, they've done the thing and, and the, the conversation is over. But from the patient's point of view, what actually happens next is that the patient has to kind of, they sort of push back into the call. So that um in overlap is the start of, um, um, so should I, and they, they have to sort of push past the ending, which has been initiated by the receptionist to, to achieve service. So the burden here is on the patient to push past the business having been finished from, from the sort of service provider's point of view in order for them to get something. And what we often found was that when patients pushed past the receptionist trying to end the conversation, they'd get something. And so, of course, you know, it's probably quite obvious to all of us that maybe if the receptionist offered that thing in the first place, that they are going to give the patient in the end, the call will be shorter and everyone will be happier and there will be less sort of friction in that conversation. Um, here's another example. Um, this is a different call at the end of the call. And you're going to see just a different kind of interactional burden um, in which here the patient is going to again push past the receptionist um, and moving to end the call and they want a, some, some very simple piece of information but they have to ask for it rather than it being kind of proactively offered by the receptionist. So here comes the end of another call to the doctors where the patient basically wants to know so what date was my appointment? Okay then. Thank you. Uh, uh, so again, the overlap, the precision is, and, and this, the order is, is really important because the receptionist is saying, thank you, whilst at the same time, the patient is saying, so it's that. And so again, they have to kind of push past the receptionist trying to move to end the call to ask something very simple. That's the 16. The 16, but So again, um, what we found was that Quite often, patients would push past the receptionist move to end the call to, to ask, you know, when should I call you back? When, so when will my results come? So, so who am I seeing? And, and it's just simple information that they want confirmation of before the patient is ready to end the call. Um, and, and more broadly, um, and Ryan and I have written about this. Um, if the receptionist initiates a thank you first in, the, in that kind of systematic way that conversations typically end, then you, you kind of know that there's a problem in that call. It's a really very straightforward metric for patients should initiate the thank you first, not, not the receptionist. If the, if the receptionist is saying thank you first, there's a problem. So let's see um, a contrast now um, with the practice that we can see that is just there in the wild again. So 
when we go back and we, we take our findings and, and sort of, you know, live through some of these moments in a training environment, we're not recommending anything particularly to, to the, um, the practitioners that we haven't seen practitioners do. So all of the practices that are part of what we might steer people towards seeing is more effective are just there as part of somebody else's ordinary practice. So here comes uh, a couple of examples. Good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Could I have an appointment to see Dr. Please, um, see when the next available one is. I don't think I've got anything pre bookable this week. Do you want me to look for the week after? Yes, for tomorrow, next week. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so obviously, obviously it's very heavily anonymized, the audio, but you can see again there that rather than wait for the patient to say, could you check for something, um, the receptionist instead offers, do you want me to look for next week? Um, and here's an example of the, the other, um, end, you know, the end of the call um, where the receptionist proactively confirms the patient's appointment without the patient having to ask for it. It's um, two, yeah, that's nice. Lovely, that's great. Okay, so that's 8.50 on Wednesday the 8th for you. Right, thank you very much. Okay, bye. 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 Okay, so this really isn't rocket science, <laughs> but it is amazing how many surgeries vary uh, or how they vary and whether or not they do these quite simple things. You know, offer an alternative to what has been requested if what has been requested is not available um, and confirm something that's going to happen next in the patient's life. And, and what we found when we compared um, the question on the uh, survey to the amount we sort of coded and did, did some stats on, on this, how much burden was there um, for patients to achieve service? And we just found a 100% association between the more burden in the call, the lower the scores are on the GP patient surgery um, survey. And then later, when we went back and trained the surgeries, those that had the training, their, their scores increased um, a bit more than, than sort of the sort of national picture without the training. OK, so final example is a different kind of burden, but something that I think, again, is very familiar and part of service. And we're going to move to a different kind of reception. Now we're going to look at people telephoning the vet about their, their pets. Um, so I'm going to show you a case where somebody phones the, the vet and they want an appointment. They, they've got a, a puppy and uh, the puppy's got a bit of a bad eye. Um, and the person that the, the, um, the potential client got the puppy from said, you know, if, if I'm worried, I should get this eye looked at. And they're going to ask to see what they did. They've never talked to this vet before. And they're going to ask if they can just drop in this afternoon. They're not really sure if they can sort of come today and what is what you're going to see happen is that the exact thing that the patient that the caller is going to ask for could be met and is going to be offered by the vet reception but in such a way that the the caller decides not to <laughs> so they're going to have their their needs absolutely met but in a way that is so off-putting that they decide not to take it up and so this vet practice loses the client um, in, in the 30 seconds or so that this takes to happen. So let's have a look at how this happens. I've just bought a puppy on Sunday. Um, I've got, she's got a bit of a bad eye, like um, a tiny bit bloodshot. The breeder said if I'm any, it's all worried to get it looked at. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I'm, I'm obviously, I haven't been to you guys before. Can I just drop in this afternoon or what's the... Uh... So there's the thing that we're going to focus on. Can I just drop in this afternoon or what's the... You know what's the how do you do it here at, in this in this uh, vet practice and the answer could be you can come at five this afternoon that could be the answer but it isn't <laughs> so let's see what happens to put somebody off whilst offering five o'clock this afternoon um what i'll have to do is i'll have to register you now um, and your puppy it is 42 pounds it's either 41 or 42 pounds 53 they've recently changed the prices um, for a vet consultation for them to look at your puppy's eye and I haven't got any till five o'clock this evening. Okay, um, let me just give my breeder a call and ask her if she thinks it's anything to worry about and then maybe I'll go through that process. Is that okay? That's absolutely fine. Okay, so rather than saying yes, of course, come at five and we can register you then <laughs> or whatever it might be. Instead, the, the vet receptionist articulates the burden on her to to progress this request. What I'll have to do is I'll have to do this 
Um, and then the, the, the format of the offer, which is just so strange. I haven't got any till five o'clock this evening. So changing this afternoon to, to this evening and saying I haven't got any until, you know, again, these things are feel quite straightforward to fix. Um, but it is amazing how often people in service provision will say things like, well, what I'll have to do is this. And then they tell you all the things they're going to have to do. And you're kind of thinking, why, why are they doing that? Why are they articulating the burden that now this, this, you know, this person who wants to give them money in, in return for a service, um, uh, it, it's, it's not really very good CX. Okay, final example um, is just a, just a different kind of thing, but again, the kind of thing that you can learn when you start to look at these things. And here it's just the, it's the burden of just keeping somebody in a call, uh, generating negative moments or moments of, of, of progress that starts to stall in, but, but with, with the aim of good practice, but with the wrong training. So this is another vet call. Good morning, Vetman Center speaking, how can I help? Could I make an appointment for my dog, please? You see, I have the bad ear. No worries, when would you like to come in? Uh so asking when would you like to come in, you might immediately think that's a quite that's quite a dangerous question. You can see why it's that it's been asked to kind of show, you know, we're we're maximally open to whenever you and we're going to try and meet your needs. But of course, the chances of the vet having a slot at the precise moment that the caller might have in mind is probably quite slim. Uh, so let's see what happens next. Um, is there any this afternoon with me? Um, she's not here today, unfortunately. She's here tomorrow. Um, no, no, it, it's best to die. Um, anyone else in? That's fine. Okay. Okay, so yeah, turns out that, that when would you like to come in doesn't quite doesn't quite work. So now we have this sequence that we probably didn't need to have if only the vet receptionist had just done what happens next first. Okay, so I've got um uh, I've got 115, 130, or 315, or 445. What would uh, you like? 315. 315. Okay. And what was the surname? So here, um, instead of instead of saying when would you like to come in, which does seem to be oriented to really the best kind of customer service, um, instead it's probably better to just offer a whole series of slots, which is what the vet receptionist does here, and then not only. Um, are the chances much higher that the that one of them will meet the, the, the client's needs but also the client still has that sense of I'm, I'm choosing something that I want. So there are multiple take-home messages that one might give if one was in a sort of training session from the kinds of things that we've seen today from you know not obviously not articulating lots of the detail um, to, to uh, people in workshops but nevertheless some things like you know being proactive, making offers rather than waiting for, for a request. Um, certainly, if you can't meet the request, offering something else. Thinking about how to design out friction and pain points in, in your paperwork or your static communication, your leaflets, your out of date bits of paper that you give, the message on your answering machine, those kinds of things. OK, before I end, I want to take us somewhere completely different because um, I, I, I thought I would end with not not just where all of this work um, has taken me, but to take you back to 1993. Um, so in 1993, I started my PhD and my PhD uh, was on university classroom interaction and I collected videos. This is a still, I'm going to play this clip in a minute, of some students um, in a small group engaged in a task. Um, and I, my focus was on well, initially, I didn't I didn't know what I was going to do, really. But my PhD supervisor, Eunice Fisher, was doing um, some research on university classroom interaction. At that point, there wasn't really very much at all in the research on cl on classroom interaction in universities. The focus was on kind of compulsory education settings, so schools. Um, and so I collected video um, of most mostly and I, I'm going to underline the mostly. Um, other other le lecturers just running tutorials said so, so in this particular classroom there would be this group um, and they would be you know with their consent they would be the ones videoed for the whole session but there'd be like three or four other groups so let's say 20 students um, and they're all doing um, small group tasks as just part of the ordinary university uh, classroom tutorial um, but when I was putting this talk together um, I, I suddenly remembered that I had really ancient 
video that um, Christian Greffenhagen had converted to digital. And so just for fun, I'm not playing the audio because it's really too embarrassing, but um, occasionally I was the tutor. <laughs> so this is me in 1993. It was quite, quite strange to look at it and think, oh my God, is that me? Was that the same person? And here I am, yeah, age 22 or three, um, 21 or 22 actually talking to students. Um, and, and in this one, I'm also collecting the data. So I'm trying to stay away <laughs> um, from the tutorial a bit, but that, obviously I can't just completely ignore them just because I'm <laughs> collecting data. So yeah, so so um, this is where it started for me. And I thought I would just mention it because I know that um, part of the headline uh, of this webinar is around classroom education. So um, this is where I started, but I want to talk about how even back then, without any sense at all of what the future held, um, I was looking at some of these materials in ways that were going to end up being really interesting for applications of various kinds. So the final clip that I'm going to play is that group um, that we've just seen, and they are doing a task whereby um, they, they have to construct um, a, basically a sort of written output together. So somebody has to write down the ideas of the group. Um, and they've been working for a bit and then all of a sudden one of the members of the small group remembers oh we need to be writing this stuff down so i just want you to see how this unfolds this is describing who's running oh, yeah. so you can now see the, um the, the 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 man at the back sort of leans um who's leaning forward now someone's describing who's writing it so if he I've analysed this endlessly, it's one of my favourites, um, so I won't go into lots of detail, but, but of course he's asking the question, so he's not being the person who, he doesn't say, oh, I'll write, I'll write down. <laughs> and then um, the guy there in the white jumper says, oh yeah, like, oh yeah, I remember that, but I'm not volunteering either. And then... I can't read it, right? you want to it. <laughs> so the uh, guy at the back with glasses says, uh, well, you can't read my writing once I've written it, and then the polar neck points at um, the woman in the group and says she wants to do it and we just get this Heh. and then uh, this happens well, secretary and, female. <laughs> and of course this is you know what what is this thing and um, this this was for me the, the kind of light bulb moment where I realized that um, I wasn't going to write a PhD on gender and communication style and start sort of saying women talk like this and men and talk like that which was kind of what I was interested in a bit but instead think about how does gender um, become relevant to interaction in ways that don't rely on me talking about styles um, or gender at all how, how is gender something that is of concern to students or participants in interaction and, and where where can it go um, and in this particular case you know maybe He's being ironic. Maybe it's banter. All these things that we we discuss now, nowadays. But but also, what what will she do in response? And her initial response is to just you know within the, the split seconds that this happens, <laughs> and to kind of laugh. And then this happens. So guy at the back is back to the task. It's uh, so he's back focusing on the task. Um, and um, the woman says, "Yeah, I'm wearing glasses. I must be the secretary." And whether that is offering kind of more category bound reasons or attributes of a secretary uh, or whether that's kind of resisting something about his categorization of her as secretary and female. Um, it's fuzzy, it's messy. Um, and what we know when we track this through the encounter is that um, the, her being the secretary crops up again and again and she doesn't really contribute anything other than to write down the ideas of the group. So this clip and then others a bit like it um, have been things that I've researched and written about and sort of going looking at you know any any categories um, the sort of big obvious ones the ones that are more sort of subtle um, or, or, or kind of constructed in the moment um, that it, it, under this sort of general heading of isms so prejudicial isms that happen in interaction how people respond to them um, and this over the years has meant that I've it, it produced guidance and training that started in an observation in 1993 um, and have taken me to, you know, writing uh, how to say when it's not OK, which is um, written with colleagues at the Discourse and Rhetoric Group at Loughborough University for our, our Maya um, uh, sort of 
Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Network called MIA. Um, and you know, we try to put together all the things that can happen when people do something like well secretary and female. And the challenge of, of, of actually responding in split seconds to that, to that kind of thing, and how the reality, the empirical fast-paced movement of um, moments like that make it quite difficult to, to talk about because in trade, you know, most people say, oh, well, I just said this and I do that, and we can we, we can talk about these things in in theory, but what does it all look like in practice? Um, and then also working um, on, you know, how do you get someone to, to put a face covering on in COVID? How do you get someone to social distance who, who isn't social distancing? And, and it, these things can, can kind of feed their way in because the practices are very similar. So um, my final, final couple of, I think I, I know I'm at time, but I just have a couple more things to say if that's okay. Um, so I just want to, tell you a post hoc story to end um, of my completely naive pathway to understanding how calm evolved and so on uh, and to leave you with where things are at now. So um, I got my PhD in 1997 and after that I started as a lecturer at University of Derby and started to think right I've done the classroom stuff. I actually still continue to work on the university tutorial data for you know, off and on over the years. Um, but I got interested in neighbour disputes and started to collect um, interactions that were relevant somehow in different kind of ways to, to neighbour disputes. And this included services like mediation services that actually help people resolve disputes of neighbour neighbor and other kinds. And eventually in 2008 to about 2012, um, after studying these things um, on a funded project until 2008, I had quite a lot of findings that I thought might be interesting for the participating mediation services. And so that photograph is me in, a, in East London um, in 2008, delivering probably really, really badly because I didn't know what I was doing at that point. But, you know, here's some interesting things that I found in my research that might help um, mediators, um, you know, get clients and then, um, be, you know, do, do mediation. And so I started to work um, with a, a, an organisation called the College of Mediators. They invited me to join their board. And then I developed CALM, the Conversation and Literate Roleplay Method in 2000 and sort of somewhere between 2008 and 2012. And then something happened, which was a complete accident. And I'm really grateful to a, a social psychologist at Lancaster University um, who recommended that I would just be interviewed for the, the British Psychological Society Psychologist magazine. Um, I had no idea, you know, it was nice to talk about, you know, impact and research and that kind of thing. Um, but it turned out that, um, that, that the people who invite scientists to come on to uh, what is a BBC um, half an hour interview with scientists about their research and their biography, it's called The Life Scientific. So in 2013, I was invited to, to be on this, this programme. I mean, it had it had, you know, Stephen Hawking's and just all famous scientists. And I was like, oh, my God, what the hell am I doing uh, on this radio programme? Um, but it was an amazing experience. And what it led to was then just loads and loads of other things. Um, of, all the invitations just kept on coming for me to go and talk about talking. And some of this stuff was, you know, really exciting, absolutely terrifying. Um, but it meant that I had opportunities to then not only start to talk about conversation analysis and, and what it can do um, in, in understanding communication, but it led to partners in all sorts of different organisations approaching me to say, would you like to come and work on this project? And we really would really like you to like the GP stuff or the vet stuff. We'd like you to tell us, you know, what's going on in, in our calls. Um, and this generated some income um, over the years, which meant that um, I could employ postdocs. So Ryan Sickfilland worked on with me on Calm full time for five years until he went uh, to Trondheim a couple of years ago. Um, and of course, lots and lots of more research. One of the companies that I went to along the way um, was this one. It's so far away and away from those tutorial recordings, but this is Typeform who do online conversational data collection. So I went and worked as an industry fellow there um, for two, from 2018 to, uh, to 19. And then they're a really quite well established startup. They're quite big um, already, but they're quite um, inspirational for other startups. And that's why um, I'm currently on a on an industry um, 
fellowship at this organization called Deployed, who last year, well, nearly two years ago now, won Microsoft's female founders competition. And so we're again, I'm just trying again, trying to sort of embed some of the principles of conversation analysis into tech products that I can't really imagine that I, you know, my, that's that that person in that video in 1993 could never have imagined that she would be here. So um, in terms of the future, I don't know where all this is going. I just keep following my nose. People sometimes ask me about, you know, what's going to happen in the future and and how did you get here? And I my, my answer to that is normally um, I just follow my nose. And over the years, I've developed a reasonably good sense of smell. So I'm just following my nose, um, working um, in the last couple of years um, also for um, UK government um, um, around the pandemic response. So as, uh, you know, my communication expertise is, hasn't, hasn't really impacted much of the UK's government messaging, that's for sure. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's enabled me to work with scientists of all types uh, for the last couple of years, which has been quite an interesting and a, it, yeah, a really good experience. Lots of different partners, um, working with new colleagues, um, trying to publish work, not just academic papers, but thinking, right, what can I put out there on Twitter or on Medium that is going to attract and, and engage wider audiences for the kind of work that we do. OK. And like I say, this e even even doing things like going on the telly and talking about communication and messaging and public health communication during COVID, which has been a little bit surreal, really, really scary, but ultimately, you know, I get another thing that is really great that conversation analysis can find its way and have a place um, in, in the COVID response in the last couple of years. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, hope you've got questions that you might like to ask about this stuff. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and a, a fascinating uh, insight into your career path there.